Buonasera. Good evening and um, uh, welcome to uh, this event with the Metropolitan uh, Ilarion. This is a very important event for us because it is a great honor for us uh, to welcome him here today. So uh, let's give him a warm round of applause. Let's give him a warm round of applause. For his presence here. Uh, we've seen him on television and in the press over these days. Uh, these were days where there has been uh, a strong dialogue, uh, days are full of grace. Over these days, uh, we've seen him, as I said, uh, when the uh, Cardinal Parolin, the uh, Vatican Secretary of State, uh, paid a visit to the Russian Orthodox Church uh, and to the Russian government. Uh, today, he has also met President Putin. Uh, the Cardinal had uh, his first meeting when he arrived in Moscow with uh, Metropolitan Ilarion. And therefore, we are really very honored to have you with us today. We're very grateful to you because uh, we do uh, realize uh, that uh, uh, these were uh, very important days for you in Russia. So thank you very much, even more so. We're even more grateful to you for being here. As far as we have understood, even from what you said today, um, uh, these days have been uh, days of strong dialogue. Charity and affection for uh, persecuted Christian, persecuted brothers and sisters uh, uh, were for us uh, uh, very uh, meaningful. Over these months and years, uh, we are increasingly witnessing uh, the uh, miracle of uh, growth, the miracle of higher esteem and knowledge between the believers of our two churches. Let me underline that uh, each one of us uh, can realize out of their own personal experience that uh, all the more uh, the church identity is based on Christ rather than uh, uh, ideas uh, and patterns. And on the personal relationship with Christ, uh, all the more the unity with other Christians. And I believe that uh, this is the miracle we are witnessing today. Metropolitan Ilarion is... Uh, very, very important uh, in uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. He is the bishop of the Russian Orthodox Church. He is the president uh, of the Department for External Relations of the Patriarchate of Moscow. He is permanent member of the Holy Synod. Um, he is the uh, rector of the, uh, the post-graduate uh, church institute, San Kirill and Metodio. He is a theo theologian. Uh, and uh, he is uh, a church historian and scholar. Uh, he became a priest in 18, 1987, then uh, he went to Lithuania. He has a degree in Oxford. He uh, taught in uh, uh, different uh, institutes of the Russian Orthodox Church. He worked in the Department for External Relations of the Patriarchate of Moscow, he then became a bishop, then archbishop, and in 2010, uh, he was appointed as uh, Metropolitan. He is a professor at the uh, Theologian Academy of God Moscow and at the University of uh, Freiburg. Uh, he also has uh, uh, many other degrees. He is a honorary professor of the uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, University in Moscow. 
and uh, is member of the Union of Russian Components. And he has been writing, actually he wrote uh, over 900 publications uh, um, on many different topics. He has also uh, uh, translated uh, uh, some books. His books uh, have been translated into 18 languages uh, and in Italy. Uh, they are now uh, releasing its uh, uh, full works. Uh, four volumes have already been published. The fifth one is going to be soon released. So we have with us tonight a really, really important person. Let me tell you, Your Excellency, as I already told you today when we met, uh, that uh, today we're very grateful to you. And uh, um, um, this is due to the fact that uh, uh, we pay love and esteem to Father Giussani and uh, to the love and esteem that he had uh, uh, for theology. We share this love, uh, the love for art and music, uh, for uh, the great uh, Russian culture that Don Giussani had uh, and conveyed to us. This affection by Don Giussani has also been expressed uh, by uh, the uh, uh, presence in the uh, uh, library in Moscow. And in the meeting in 2010, uh, we had uh, the Metropolitan Filaret with us. Uh, today, we have invited you because uh, uh, we want uh, this meeting, we want uh, this dialogue, we want this affection that we have, that we nourish for the uh, Orthodox Church in Russia may continue. And we want to continue to learn from the religious sensi sensitiveness uh, of the Orthodox tradition. Don Giussani has always told us that we have to learn and we want to continue to learn. Today, you're going to talk about the uh, role of the Council of the 1917-1918 in the rebirth of the Russian Orthodox Church. That was a dramatic event in 1978 and 19, uh, 1917 and 1918, but that led to rebirth. The light uh, is a cast in the dark. There was a title of an exhibition that was made in 2016 at the meeting that was dedicated to those years of the Russian Orthodox Church and its martyrs. And you will see that this light will also be cast on the speech that will be given by the Metropolitan today. Before giving him the floor, I didn't read something in his bibliography, which is the following. This is a small secret. He, he is a member of the Union of Russian Composers because he is also a composer of holy music. Uh, um, his music was performed in the Vatican and in Moscow. And I think that um, music has to do with uh, his passion for meeting and for friendship. The Metropolitan, uh, during an interview, said that uh, music exists uh, beyond uh, religious borders. Uh, music is uh, universal. Music is uh, uh, a way to get closer to uh, different categories of Christians. And therefore, uh, now we will uh, perform some music uh, created by uh, uh, the Metropolitan himself.
bello. It's beautiful. I now give you the floor. Дорогие друзья, я очень рад возможности принимать участие в встрече в Риме. Я впервые в этом городе и впервые принимаю участие в этой встрече. Я благодарю сеньору Гуарнери за приветствие в мой адрес и за представление моей биографии. Слушая эту биографию, я, я нашел ее очень впечатляющей. Сейчас отношения между нашими церквами, между Русской Православной Церковью и Our relationship between the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Russian Orthodox Church are going through very positive times. Last year, on the 12th of February, there was a meeting between Pope Francis and the Patriarch of Moscow and all Russia, Kirill. It was the first meeting in the history. Uh, in history between uh, a Moscow Patriarch and the Pope. And uh, this uh, meeting will have long-term consequences for our churches. One of the consequences was uh, the fact that uh, the holy rests of uh, Saint uh, Nicholas uh, were taken to Moscow from Bari, and uh, over these two months, when uh, uh, they remain in uh, Russia, they uh, were uh, visited by about 2.5 million people. So this shows uh, that uh, we are a people of uh, believers uh, who worship Saint Nicholas. And this has been a very important event in the history of our bilateral relations. The theme, the topic of my lecture today is the role of the local Pan-Russian Council of 1917-1918 in uh, the new birth of the Russian Orthodox Church. Today, actually, I uh, visited the exhibition here in uh, the meeting dedicated to the 1917 revolution. It's the 100th anniversary, and we celebrate the same anniversary also in Russia, in our Orthodox Church. And I will be talking about the events that are connected with that revolution. The joint communique of Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill mentions the countless martyrs of the first millennium who testimonied their faith in Christ and became seed of Christians. Well, today I would like to talk about martyrdom too, but I'm not going to talk about the first millennium, but rather of uh, what happened one year, 100 years ago after the October Revolution. In 1917, in February, the Russian monarchy was overturned and that was the so-called bourgeois revolution. The ad interim government took power, but it only lasted about six months. In October, the country was overwhelmed by a proletarian revolution, which will then take the name of October Revolution. So this uh, bloody revolution incited by Germany, which was at war with Russia at the time, marked the beginning of a period of unprecedented persecutions against the Russian church. In the 
period of time between the two revolutions, the Orthodox Church in Russia created a, a local council, something the church had been working on for over 10 years. And it opened on August the 28th, the day of the dormition of the Mother of God. But after two months, uh, the power fell into the the hands of the uh, Bolsheviks, who did not hide their hatred against the church. Uh, the first and most important uh, deed of the council, and uh, this is actually the main event in, contem in the contemporary history of the church, was the restoration of the patriarch. Um, the council with the patriarch uh, Tikon gave the church a, a spiritual guide, which was the symbol of its unity, of its allegiance to Christ and its communion. This obviously had a very important uh, um, consequence, uh, and uh, the uh, clerical government uh, had been uh, replaced by the patriarch, by the patriarchate, and uh, this was a dividing line in the history of the Russian church. But I believe that there was also a second important result of the local council. It actually favored the unity of the church during the persecutions, which actually started with the beginning of the council. Without the council, the church would not have not been able to stand these persecutions. And the council actually enabled uh, an active involvement uh, in uh, the activities of the church, both for the lower cler clergy and for laymen, making them see their responsibility in the future of the church. The council managed to organize the life of the church according to new principles without the intervention of the state. It uh, took and approved uh, important legal decisions, uh, drew up uh, the future uh, guidelines for the existence of the church in the new social and political conditions of the time. At the beginning of the second session of the council, the council's members needed to change uh, their uh, um, work because there was a new political situation in the country which actually uh, brought about new problems uh, that they had not foreseen. After uh, the revolution of uh, October, Carso Caselo, in Carso Caselo, uh, Father Johan Kokchurov was shot. He was the first contemporary martyr of the Russian church. From that moment on, persecutions against the clergy became systemic and massive. In order to attract the attention of public opinion on the illegal deeds committed in the country and in their hope to make the new unbridled government see reason, on February the 1st, 1918, the patriarch uh, issued a pastoral letter that describes in very vivid terms what was happening in Russian. Difficult times are those that uh, the church is now experiencing in Russian. Uh, open and hidden enemies of the uh, truth of uh, Christ have started persecutions against this uh, truth, and they wanted to defeat the Christian cause and uh, wanted to spread a seed of evil, hatred, and uh, fratricidal wars, a power that should have uh, uh, should have brought it to Russia right and justice, it shows only an unbridled arbitrariness that actually is fed on violence against the Orthodox Church. Mend your ways, you senseless people. Stop your bloody repressions. But these senseless people did not change their ways. They did not listen to the words of the patriarch and did not stop their atrocities. Just a few days after this letter, Later, on February the 7th, 1918, uh, near the walls of Lavra of the Kiev uh, caves, the oldest members of uh, the Russian hierarchy was killed. The honorary president of uh, the Metropolitan Local Council, Vladimir, uh, in Ki the, of Kiev, before dying, he said, I am not afraid, I do not fear no one 
and nothing. I'm ready to offer my life for uh, the uh, uh, Church of Christ and for the ortho Orthodox faith uh, to protect it from its enemies. I will uh, suffer until the end. The body of the Metropolitan was found the following morning. It lied in a pool of blood. They had ripped the locket of the Panagia from his neck. He had uh, been uh, shot uh, and he had been slayed with a bayonet and he had been hit with the handle of a gun. But he still had his hands in a pose of blessing for his uh, murderers. The news of the death of the honorary president of the council shocked all the members. And as a reaction, the council decided uh, to commemorate every year with prayers uh, on that day uh, all of the confessors and martyrs who died in this year of uh, persecutions. So that uh, commemoration is uh, takes place on the day of the death of the Metropolitan Vladimir of Kiev. And since they were um, afraid that the primate of the Russian church um, could be actually uh, killed himself, they asked him to designate uh, uh, someone to substitute him and to find some candidates for this post. Uh, in case the council would not be able to uh, vote for uh, his uh, successors. Uh, the first, ses uh, the first um, sessions of uh, um, the first meetings of uh, the second session of the council were devoted to the events that were taking place in the country. The beginning of the persecutions were, were once more uh, marked by a, a provision of the council on the deed of the clerical administrative system, which says that the new conditions of the clerical life call upon uh, great efforts uh, on the part of uh, the people of the church uh, so that uh, the liturgical life uh, can take place uh, with dignity in spite of the persecution. In 1918, uh, news of uh, arrests, uh, deportations, and executions uh, were uh, present at all the meetings of the local council. The council uh, tried to help the people that were arrested. They organized the council delegations that went to the place where these people, people were uh, imprisoned. Uh, uh, an ad hoc commission was uh, created to solve the questions linked with the repression against the church. This commission was the first uh, to collect and uh, uh, to register the sufferings of the Russian church in the 20th century. In the council's archives, uh, there are a lot of uh, books uh, that uh, contain declarations from these detention places. The persecution against the church and the repression against the uh, uh, priests uh, were uh, uh, discussed also at almost all the meetings of the third uh, session of the council. The session started with the memorial service for the Tsar Nicholas II, who, was, uh, who had been killed, and was uh, concluded with the reading from a book of contemporary martyrs. Uh, whose name were known at the time. So if we compare uh, the list that was read uh, at the end of that council and uh, the list of names we know today, uh, well, we realize uh, that they really didn't know much about the extent of these repressions. Apart uh, from the, rep the physical repression of uh, the clergy and the laymen, the new um, government uh, did all it could to destroy the church, also from the legislative point of view. Its decrees, um, actually uh, took away the right to exist to the Orthodox Church. The Patriarch Deacon at uh, uh, the la last, last session of the Council said that uh, the Church now needed to become a Church of Confessors and Martyrs. And the future confessor of uh, the faith, the Metropolitan Arseni, said, the time of sacrifice has come. We believe that uh, uh, if we will have martyrs and confessors, uh, the power of uh, the uh, confession of the faith and of martyrdom will overcome persecutions. The council started when uh, the uh, ad interim government was in power and ended uh, when the uh, civil war was was raging. Its uh, meetings took place in uh, many sessions on September the 20th, 1918. 
the members of the council met for uh, their last uh, meeting, which was uh, the 170th meeting. In uh, their uh, um, deliberation, they said that the next uh, meeting would take place in uh, spring 19. 1921, but the raging of the persecution against this, the church made it impossible to convene this new meeting. In the years of persecution, millions of believers suffered persecutions, har harassment, and discrimination from the ridicule to the dismissal of wor from work to detention and uh, execution without stopping to love and pray for our enemy, says Patrick Kirill today. Uh, they suffered their uh, calvary. A lot of our uh, saints of the past century, some were canonized as uh, confessors and martyrs, uh, whereas uh, we do not have uh, news on uh, the uh, sacrifice of many others. We don't even have the name of many. And all this carried on for over 70 years, uh, from 1917 until the perestroika at the end of the 1980s. From the very beginning of the Soviet power, all the um, religious schools, the chapels in uh, schools and hospitals were closed down. Since 1918, monasteries and uh, parishes were closed. In 1939, in the whole country, there were only about 100 Orthodox churches out of the over 60,000 that existed in 1917. The hardest blow for the church were the arrests and the executions of their priests. In 1918, 1920, about 28 bishops were killed, thousands of priests were imprisoned or executed. In the 1930s, the number of the victims of repressions among the clergymen reached thousands, uh, thousands whereas among the uh, faithful, they were millions. The uh, climax was reached in 1937-38, in just one year, over 160,000 people were repressed for four religious reasons, and 107,000 were executed. Amongst those who were killed in 1937, I would like to uh, um, pay a tribute to Father Konstantin Lyubomudrov, who was the parish priest of the uh, uh, church uh, of uh, uh, Bolsaya Ordinka in Moscow, where I am a priest at the, I'm a par I'm the par at the moment. And he was uh, condemned uh, to execution in uh, uh, 1937 on uh, the uh, 17th of November. After two days, he was executed in Butovo, near Moscow, where uh, in the 30s, thousands of people were executed, having been accused of espionage or uh, anti-revolutionary and anti-Sovietic activities. So there were uh, grown-ups and elderly people, students, uh, as well as school children. The youngest among those that were killed in Butovo uh, were 15, 16, 17 year old. They, they were uh, killed um, in dozens. Uh, and there were about, uh, well, there were hundreds of uh, 18 and 20 years old uh, that were killed there then. These people were uh, t uh, driven in, in uh, mm, trucks uh, to this place, uh, about 50 people for each truck. So they were then taken to barracks where they were controlled. This procedure of control and head counting was very long. And in the do in Dawn, they were lined up on the edge of uh, enormous uh, ditches where they were shot in the head. The corp corpses were then uh, uh, put into these uh, graves, uh, which were recovered with earth. A considerable uh, part of those who were killed were uh, uh, bishops, uh, priests, uh, monks, uh, and laymen, people who belonged to the so-called uh, um, clerical and monarchical organization. Most of the people who were executed uh, belonged to the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, among the uh, Butov's martyrs, there are uh, six bishops, over 300 uh, priests, deacons, uh, monks, lectors and directors of uh, parish uh, choirs. Among those uh, executed in Butifer for uh, uh, religious um, 
reasons, uh, there were uh, old uh, believers, there were Baptists, Chumulas. This uh, uh, factory of death in Butov was always working. A mass shooting started in August 1937 and went on until October 1938. Normally, about 100 people were killed per day, sometimes even 300, 400, or 500 people, if not more. In 15, um, in 15 months, over 20,000 people were killed. Uh, their arrests uh, are still there under the earth of the Butovo polygon. This is not the only place where uh, mass killings took place in the former uh, Soviet Union. There were many places like this one, and we only know a few of them today. In the 1930s, uh, Almost all, all that the Russian Episcopacy was exterminated. Only four ordinary bishops were still free, against whom, uh, well, allegations uh, were uh, created, and they could have been arrested in, at any moment. So the structure of the church seemed to have collapsed. But oh, even in this difficult period, the church resisted, and this also thanks to the local council of 1917-1918, because it consolidated the strength of the church and expressed an opinion on that time of atheism that uh, was beginning, and uh, make everyone responsible clergymen and laymen alike for the future of the church. This, is a, this council is a, a sort of a religious beacon. The council father gave an example of uh, a faith and uh, of uh, um, strength in front of these persecution. As it is shown by the results of the census of 1937, over Half of the citizens of the atheist Sovietic state, about 60%, said, stated that they believed in God in spite of the violence and uh, the atrocities committed against the believers in the country. This enabled the church to resist and to be born again once the external circumstances changed. <laughs> The authorities had to review their attitude towards the church only after 70 years in 1988 when the uh, local council was held on the uh, celebrations of the 1,000 years from the christening of Rus. From the council onwards, the church tradition came about once again and the church life was recovered, especially in the resolutions of the local council of 1917-1918. Then the celebrations of the 1,000 years of the christening of Rus that the authorities had initially considered as a church initiative turned into a solemnity involving the whole population, bearing witness of the vitality of the church, that the persecutions could not stop, and of its great uh, authority before the eyes of the people. In the local council of 1988, for the first time after the Soviet period, uh, priests and laymen could openly discuss about the problems of the church. And uh, the model that they made reference to was the local council of 1917-1918. The jubilee of 1988 was uh, the uh, year when there was a radical turning point in the relations between the church and the state. The church became what had been in the times of Saint Prince Vladimir, as in the main spiritual stronghold of the state existence of the Russian people. This jubilee led to the second christening of Rus, which is still continuing today. Between the end of the 1980s and early 1990s, uh, millions of people throughout the former Soviet Union reached the faith. In the big urban churches, uh, every day, tens and hundreds of people were christened, and only one priest over one year could christen hundreds and hundreds of people. One year later, in October 1989, uh, the Council of Bishops uh, uh, was held. 
which approved, among other things, the very important resolution to canonize Patriarch Tichon. And it also uh, discussed the problem of the uh, review of the discrimin discriminatory attitude of the state towards the church. The Rasan Church declared that it was necessary for the state to change its legislation and to acknowledge church as a legal entity. One year later, in 1990, the local council of the Russian Orthodox Church was held. For the first time after 1917, the Patriarch was elected by secret ballot. This council also set up a commission to canonize the saints. Its task was to prepare the materials for canonization of the new martyrs of the 20th century. The attention to sacrifice bear witness of the fact that the Russian church uh, recalled the persecutions and took account of the experience of the Council of 1917 and 1918. At the end of my report, for you to think and to imagine uh, how is the Russian Orthodox uh, uh, Church uh, being developed today, I would like to give you some numbers. In 1988, uh, when we uh, celebrated the 1,000 years of the christening of Rus, the Russian, Russian Orthodox Church only had 60,000 priests and 600 uh, priests. Now we have 36,000 priests and 36,000 uh, parishes. We had 21 monasteries throughout Russia. Today, there is more than 950 monasteries. All these monasteries are full of monks nuns who are usually very young or adults. There were only uh, three church institutes in, in the past. Now there is at least uh, 50 of them. And uh, we also have uh, 50 theology chairs uh, inside uh, uh, laymen high schools. If we look at how our church has developed, we see that uh, during this period, uh, we've basically opened 1,000 churches every year. That is three churches every day. I don't believe that never in the history of church uh, has there been uh, such a religious rebirth uh, in such a fast way. Maybe just after uh, uh, the uh, um, Edict of Milan. Maybe uh, uh, just after the Edict of Milan, something of that kind happened, but we don't have statistics uh, of that time. Whereas uh, for our time, we do have statistics. And the statistics, uh, uh, gives us reason for hope. I would really like to wish for all of us that Christ of faith, uh, which has been uh, persecuted and has been repressed uh, uh, over its 2,000 years of existence, can continue to inspire us, uh, to lead us, uh, and to guide our churches, and to give us all the strength to pay service uh, that the God uh, has asked us uh, to pay. I wish uh, all of you that God may help you and that uh, God uh, can keep us in his grace uh, and can uh, keep us uh, uh, in custody under uh, um, St. Mary, under Mary.
Grazie. Thank you. I believe, Your Eminence, that uh, nothing else has to be added to uh, this uh, uh, wish that you made for all of us. And I think that this uh, warm round of applause that you've been given is uh, a, a gesture of uh, warm gratitude to you and uh, uh, to the uh, martyrdom that you told us and uh, warm gratitude to you for your presence here and uh, a deep sharing uh, on our part. We deeply shared what you have wished for all of us because actually we can only wish that the uh, personal relation with uh, uh, mystery which the mystery is entrusted to all of us. Uh, we only can wish that this personal relation may continue and uh, may uh, show our willingness to live uh, and uh, passionate desire to uh, judge things uh, and to live in this world. Because you also said that uh, even uh, uh, during the period of martyrdom uh, and even during the hardest times the church could uh, resist and uh, could resist uh, uh, judging on the uh, uh, period of uh, atheism that was about to begin. I think that uh, from what you have said uh, Jesus uh, bears witness of what uh, you have spent because judgment uh, is not to destroy. Judgment uh, gives an opportunity to embrace with more awareness uh, the reality, the world around us. And this is why this meeting is organized. And this is why we are all here over these days uh, in order to try and get to know, in order to try and understand uh, the world that is around us. And I think that uh, tonight's event... Uh, has been uh, important and crucial in this context. Uh, there is uh, something that we have to get to know and that we have to understand. We, we want to continue doing what we are doing and we want to continue meeting here out of this passion. And uh, we wish that to continue. So you know that uh, during these days, uh, we are uh, uh, urging you to uh, contribute to fundraising. Um, even this year, uh, you can contribute to the meeting. This is why inside many pavilions, uh, you can find the desks, Dona Ora, donate now. Donations must only be given to the dedicated desks uh, where you see the volunteers with a green T-shirt. This is done so that uh, we can continue meeting here and that this meeting can continue to be an opportunity for dialogue, meeting and assessing the truth, assessing uh, the world that is around us. Uh, thank you very much to all of you and thank you very much to the uh, uh, Metropolitan uh, Ilarion. Thank you.